But well, let's get into the Word of God. Amen. Amen. A year of prayer. Can you believe it's almost October? Glory to God. I wish the weather felt like it. <laughs> it's coming, though. It's got to come. I was out early the other morning. The stars were out, and I just felt a little bit, just a, a little breeze. And it was, it was early, and I was... I was out in the woods and I was like, oh, it's going to feel great today. By 8.30, it was heat, in, heat index of 93. I'm like, yep, today's not that day. <laughs> we have all year been talking about prayer. And if you've attended Coastline for any amount of time, and this is, this is where this was birthed from. November of last year, I preached a message on the persistent widow. Now, if you're not familiar with the Bible, the persistent widow is just a, a, a story, an account in the Bible where this widow just kept asking, kept asking, and kept asking this, this judge. And the Bible says he was unjust. He wasn't fair. He wasn't a good person. He didn't have good morals. He didn't have good values. But because she kept asking, he finally granted her what she was asking. And Jesus said, how much more so would our Father in heaven being a good father Ask, seek, knock. And, and I made this statement because if I were, I'll try it. Read. Yeah, it's part of our DNA. We've been saying that to you guys for 18 and a half years now. But I made this statement because you all know prayer's hard work. Amen? No, but nobody said that. Everyone just looked at me like, what are you talking about? Lord bless this food in Jesus' name, amen. That's not hard. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom, and will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, us trespass, we forgive those trespass, and give us this us have temptation, because we deserve evil. That's not hard at all. That's not prayer. And so throughout the years, we've looked at circumstances, different people who are in desperate places, and we've learned desperate prayers, prayers for people who were hurting, prayers of repentance. We looked at David's life when he, he just blew it. And um, I hope throughout this year that you are growing and have grown through this series, a whole year series, as much as I have. Because I told the Lord, I said, I don't wanna be a man who prays. I wanna be a man of prayer. Big difference. Big difference. If you're new to church, you just got saved, or maybe, maybe you're gonna give your heart to the Lord tonight. You say, well, I don't know how to pray. Well, if you can talk, direct your words towards God and believe he's there, that's prayer. There are no these and thous and darts. If you don't, listen, if you don't speak every day in King James language, then God doesn't wanna hear from you in King James language, right? He, he just loves to hear from his children. And uh, he's big enough for your questions. Good? So that, this led us into a prayer to stand firm in the battle, and we've been talking about the full armor of God, standing firm with the full armor of God. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Ephesians chapter six. If you don't, it's coming on the screen. If you would like a Bible, we'll get you one tonight. Um, and we would love to get you one, one condition, that, uh, that you read it and don't throw it in the car floorboard. Um, Ephesians chapter six, we'll read verses 10 through 14. This is the apostle Paul writing to the church at Ephesus that he had planted. All the way at the end of the book of Ephesians, um, the letter that he wrote them, and remember, man put numbers in the Bible. When you read Ephesians, Colossians, Galatians, those are letters that Paul wrote to the church. So it's really cool sometimes to cover up the numbers and read them, like, just read it straight through. But this is the, the end of, of, of chapter six, the end of the letter to the church at Ephesus. So he says, finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, strategies, tactics, attacks of the devil. For we do not wrestle 
against flesh and blood. In other words, we don't, we don't, the, the fight that we're in, it's not a natural fight. But we, we fight against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to Therefore, having girded your waist with truth, with the belt of truth, putting on the breastplate of righteousness. So we made it through the belt of truth. And, you know, I don't have time to go preach those every week into the breastplate of righteousness. And man, this has been just so much fun to study. Um, And you get to verse 15, and this is where we've been camping for a few weeks and we'll be here for a a few more weeks. So it's Ephesians 6, verse 15. And then after the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness is in place and having shod your feet. Now, most of us don't use that word. Having covered, prepared your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. If you read Ephesians 6, 15 in the Amplified Version, it reads like this. And having shod your feet in preparation to face the enemy with the firm-footed stability, the promptness and the readiness produced by the good news of the gospel of peace. Focus with me on facing the enemy, being firm-footed, being stable, being ready. We'll talk about promptness in the weeks to come. Firm-footed. Grounded, stable, sure of your footing. And we, we've been showing a couple different pictures. I think we have the same, same pictures. The same picture up there of the boot on there? It's not, okay. But many of us would, would view, now, if you've not been here, Paul spent a lot of time in prison. The apostle Paul was in prison a lot. And he wasn't in prison because he was a thief. He wasn't in prison because, you know, he... Uh, He was in prison for preaching the gospel because where he would go and preach, these regions were under the authority of the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire, they didn't like trouble. They didn't like, you know, any kind of gatherings together. They didn't like any, any, anything that would be like considered. So something, something could be called a rebellion really quick. Well, Paul, who was Saul, God changed his name. Jesus shows up and meets him on the road to Damascus. He was a Pharisee. A Pharisee in the Bible is a very religious person who studied the word. Who They had given their life over to being zealous for the law. He was a Pharisee among Pharisees. In other words, he was, he was church folk above church folk. He knew all the language. He knew all the, he knew when to smile, when to raise his hands, when to clap. He went to, you know, grip and grin, like all the stuff. I'm just being funny there. But he, because some of, we know people like that, right? Um, that's, that's not what our church is about here. We're about being real with one another, talking about real problems. That's why we're doing a series about being in battles, because we know we all go through things in our life. So he spends a lot of time in prison because after he's converted, he was still passionate. See, when God creates you, informs you in your mother's womb and knows you, the Bible talked about DNA way before science figured it out. Read Psalms. For I knit you together. There is not one person in this world that has the 100% exact DNA. Why? Because God has a warehouse of DNA that's never going to wear out. It never runs out. And so if you are a passionate person, like if one is good, 10 is better, right? Like if, if it, if it'll go 120, every once in a while, you should let it go 120 in a safe place. My wife doesn't understand that theology. She just does not. Uh, 
if there's a if there's a 50-50 chance you're gonna get stuck, you have to try. <laughs> like if you're passionate before you get saved, Saul, then Paul was passionate about persecuting Christians. He couldn't stand Christians, why? Because Christians, this new grace, this new gospel, this gospel of peace, this gospel of salvation, it was messing up the religious system. In other words, giving was down, right? Because now the Pharisaical priests, the leaders of what was then known as the temple, they were losing the power to manipulate people because people could not fulfill the law. That's why Jesus had to come. God gave the law, we couldn't fulfill it. He's a just God, but he loves us. So he sent his only son, Jesus, to live perfectly, to check every box of the law, die our death that we deserve, sinless, blameless, so that we could be restored back to a relationship with God and spend an eternity with him in heaven. He's a just God, can't go back on his word, but he's a loving God. You see that? So Paul was, when he, he was passionate before he got saved, he got saved. Just because you get saved doesn't mean that you, you all of a sudden, if you weren't a church mouse before, you don't have to be a church mouse now. Right? If you were passionate about the things of the world and you were pa- and that's your personality, then that personality doesn't change when you get saved. God just changes the focus of that passion. So when Paul encounters Jesus and realizes for himself that he has been persecuting the people that really belong to the true God, it wrecks him. Matter of fact, he was blind for three days. He had to be led by his hands and back, back into this town. And so then he starts preaching. He starts preaching this new gospel. Well, he was so passionate about it that all these people were gathering around to hear Paul preach and there were miracles happening. Well, not only were the religious people upset with him, the Pharisees, the Roman Empire, they just didn't like gatherings. So the Pharisees then began to stir up politically the Roman people saying, hey, you need to watch this guy, Paul. He's bad news. He's talking bad about you guys. And so Paul was in prison all the time, all the time, like a lot. A lot of his letters that we read in the Bible, written from prison. I want you to think about that. Read Philippians next time you read it and think, think about all the positive things that he says that God can do in you. He's in prison. I say all that to say that he was very familiar with how a Roman soldier would get dressed and undressed for the day of work. And so there's a metaphor here he's using when he talks about the full armor of God. He's talking about, he's watching, he's watching these soldiers get dressed and undressed for the day. So he talks about the belt, talks about the breastplate. Then he goes on to the shoes, and then we'll get to the shield of faith, helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So these shoes, they weren't sandals. If you've ever seen the, the, the series, The Chosen, you know, um, as a matter of fact, Brad was flying to LA this, this last week and sent me a picture in a, uh, is it, what's his name? Gaius on The Chosen was sitting next to Brad. <laughs> he took a picture of him, sent it to me, and I'm like, I said one word, question mark, sandals. <laughs> but we have this perception because we don't, we, we, if we read the Bible, we don't really think about it. No one went to war in sandals. Nobody did. No, they were more like cleats, spikes, boots. Why? Because you had to be sure-footed. And so Paul is watching them put these cleats on that like every time they would march in unison, you'd hear this and they were made that way so they could stand firm. 
Paul references standing four times in the verses we just read. And the only way we can stand firm in the face of the attacks of the enemy are through putting on the full armor of God every day. You know, we titled this the cleats of peace. The war cleats of peace. So let's jump into it. Number one, the courage to stand firm with the cleats of the gospel of peace is only found in the power of the cross. Wow. Where does courage come from? Why, does, why do some people run in when everyone else is running out? How can one person go through tragedy in their life and, and come out of it, beauty from ashes, still got questions for God, and, and, and they'll get to ask them one day, God will connect the dots, but they find this internal courage to get out of bed one more day. Just get out one more day. Remember, we've talked about this. If you just get out of bed and get back in bed, Next week, get out of bed, get back in bed, get out of bed, go to the kitchen. Some of us have been there. Next day, go to the mailbox. Next day, maybe go to a store where you won't see anybody you know because you don't want to talk to anybody. But it takes courage to come out of depression, grief. Yet there are other people who just can never seem to find that courage Let's say there's a building on fire. There's always gonna be someone that runs into that building to help people, right? And there's always gonna be 10 more that stand outside the building going, this is terrible with their phone, <laughs> filming it. No blame, but we are in a spiritual war. You gotta know that. Pastor Jason, what are you talking about? We're all spiritual beings. You say, no, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not in a spiritual war. I, I'm fighting with my family. I'm, I'm at war with my husband. I'm at war with my wife. I'm at war with my kids. No, all that's spiritual. All that is spiritual. Because if the enemy can destroy your marriage or your family, if he can destroy that unit, then everything else after that crumbles. So the courage to stand firm when the arrows are flying, the bullets are whizzing, downrange, it's going down. You had a bad day that turned into a bad week, that turned into a bad month. You didn't think it could get any worse. Then it turned into a bad year and that bad year went to a year and a half and you thought you were coming out the other side of it. And then here comes another blow and another blow. And you know, human nature finally just says, Bump this, I am running. I quit. I just quit. I, I don't want any more of this. But let me tell you something, friend. If you don't quit, you cannot lose. Sometimes all you can do is stand, stand again, keep standing. Right? If, if you're gonna go down, which you're not, if you keep standing... You will not. God will not. Listen, he, is, he will be by your side. He will, hold you, he will uphold you with his righteous right hand. You will pass through the fire, but, but it will not burn you. You will go through the waters, but they will not overtake you. He is an ever-present help in times of trouble. He is a good God. He will walk. He's the valley walker. He's the midnight talker. He is the one that runs in when everyone else runs out. He is the definition of a true, that's the best definition I've ever heard of a real friend, one who walks in when everyone else is walking out. And that's who Jesus is. He will come find you where you're at. So the courage is found in the power of the cross because the courage that Jesus had to have to face the cross is almost incomprehensible with the power and the authority that he had to set himself free from that. Now, the power of the cross is the greatest expression. The cross is the greatest expression of God's love. 
You wanna know who God really is? Look at the cross. Look at God's son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, bloody, beaten, half skinned alive, naked, nailed to a cross, like, like a thief, like a murderer. All the while having the courage not to call out on the angels that could deliver him. The power of the cross is found in the power of love. But God demonstrates his own type of love in this, that while we were still dead in our sin, in other words, we were worthless in the economy of heaven. Do you, under, you do understand that, right? Have you ever traveled to a different country and forgot to exchange your money? And you're like, yeah, I'll, I'll take the, one of those. And you, and you pull out a $10 bill and they look at you like, we don't take that here. And you're like, oh, it's not worth anything. God is holy, can't be around sin. And so we in our sin, not us as individuals, because he loved us. But while we were still dead in our sin, God demonstrates his own type of love in this, that he sent his only son to die for us. So it's the power of God's love that brings power to the cross, because the cross doesn't ha happen without the power of love. The great poet Huey Lewis. Oh, y'all gonna wake up now. Yeah, yeah. It's the power of love. I just make sure y'all are there, man. You're. Oh, watch this, Isaiah 53, five. But he was wounded, talking about Jesus. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. How, how come it, when I explain this and teach this, you're gonna, you, you'll get it. You'll say, wow, I've never thought of that. He was wounded for our shortcoming, our sin. We don't have a problem with that. We quote that, don't we? We do. He was bruised for our iniquities. The energy before, after sin, the, the, things that, the, the things inside of us that want what they want. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. Those first two, like he was wounded for our transgressions, he's bruised for our iniquities. We know that. We receive that because we know we need to be forgiven. If you're sick, spiritually, you haven't accepted Christ in your heart yet, put your faith in Jesus and accepted the free gift of salvation that comes from God and God alone and only through Jesus Christ, you're sick spiritually. So spiritually speaking, we are healed by what he did on the cross, but that's not just spiritual, that's physical. God still heals people. Not everyone. I don't understand that, I'm not God. Don't ever let anyone tell you your loved one didn't get healed because you didn't have enough faith. That is not in the Bible, that's a bunch of baloney. But why do we have such a hard time remembering that the chastisement, the, the, the whipping post, the, the cat, tail, whip, the heaviness, the weight that what he was going through for our peace was upon him. How come we don't cry out to God in reference to that? If we're sick, we cry out for healing. If we know we need to be forgiven, we ask for forgiveness. If we know we're headed down a bad path and, and, and iniquity and, and, and desire of our flesh is leading us down this road, you know, we get accountability, we ask God, God, I need you to help me in this. I don't wanna go down this road. But do you, don't you, do you see that? When's the last time that you looked at this and said, oh God, I am anxious, I am worried, I am fearful. 
I want to run. I want to hide. I want to move away. I don't want to fight anymore. There is no peace in my life. Circumstance after circumstance after circumstance does not lend itself to peace. When is the last time you reminded yourself that at the cross, through the power of the cross and the weight that was upon him of all humanity was on him so that you and I could live in peace. We, it's like, yeah, we know, God, I need to be healed. I don't, here's the thing. I don't think we understand the destruction of a life over a period of time lived in worry, fear, and anxiousness. So we don't really take it that serious. We, you know, we, we go to the doctor, get some medicine, or we, we find the bottom of the bottle, or we, you know, whatever it is that we can do to escape, go to another relationship, and then another relationship, and then another relationship. We try to escape because anything that will give us just a few moments of peace. Well, let's move. I've seen couples, man, I've been doing this 25 years. I have seen couples like, you know what? We're gonna move and get a fresh start. And I'm like, bless you, pray over them. And me and Rain will be talking that afternoon and I'll be like, hey, so-and-so's moving to wherever. Because if I said somewhere, somebody's gonna say, he's talking about me. I'm not talking about anybody specifically. Lots of people have done this. But you know what the problem with that is? Wherever you go, there you are. So you, you might as well deal with whatever is going on in your life that's causing these things where you're at. Stand, plant your feet with the belt of truth, the whole understanding, the theologically and doctrinally understanding of who God's character is, which only comes from the Bible, and the breastplate of righteousness that protects the vital organs in a spiritual sense, our soul, our heart, our soul, our emotions where the enemy comes to steal our peace. I'd love to be able to stand before you today and say, man, I don't get, I don't get ruffled. I just float around all week. I don't have problems. I mean, you might think they're problems, but they don't bother me. I have learned to live in 100% euphoria I have manifested through the, you know, that's a bunch of crap. <laughs> no, no. We all, the enemy is constantly trying to steal our peace. Why? Because Jesus paid for it. And he'll never have it again. So now I'll move, I'll move through this next part really quick because it really sets up next week. But you got to see this. In Exodus 17, 8, so we're all the way back, second book of the Bible, children of Israel, the Exodus. Now, Amalek came and fought with Israel and Rephidim. You skip down to verses um, 15 and 16, and it says, so Moses, Aaron, Hur go to the top of the mountain. Remember the story? When his hands go down, Joshua starts losing. We forget how bloody Joshua was. Hands go up, Joshua's just, and so I'll get into that next week because there's a parallel there for, for, for what we're talking about. But the important thing is, is right here, when, when the children of Israel beat Amalek, who was the father of the Amalekites, it was like, it would be like the University of Memphis, which is, I'm from Memphis. It would be like the University of Memphis beating Who's, who's number one in college football right now? Texas. Florida State? Texas. The, the Gators? Texas. I'll pick on Alabama. Like, it'd, be like, it'd be like University of Memphis beating Alabama in football. Now basketball, we got you. But it would be, and that's what this battle was. It was just like underdog. They were not, they were, Moses said, Joshua, pick some men and go. They didn't have an army. They, they were a bunch of people, shepherds. They, they were just like, okay, let's go fight. And so they won, great victory, routed the Amalekites. 
So Moses builds an altar and he called the name, the Lord is my banner. For he said, because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Next week, I'm gonna teach you what that means. I, I bring this up because this is where we get the covenant name, Jehovah Nisi. This, that, that's where we get it. The Lord is my banner. Now, if you play that out, Jehovah Nisi, our banner, our standard, insignia. Our banner, when, when troops would go to war, they had these massive banners, and on those banners would be, it, there, there would be a, we call them logos. And on that logo, maybe a lion's face, and then on another flag, their ethos, what they believed in, what they were fighting for. And then on another one, the king's face. And then on another one, you know, like ships would have them everywhere as a sign of authority and power. And the more banners that, that you would see as you went out to fight against an army, the more intimidation that would come your way because you'd be like, goodness gracious, there's a lot of them. Look at those banners. Man, if they got that many people to wave banners, how many people do they have that are gonna kill us? It was the standard by which they fought from a standpoint of authority and victory what they believed in, power, authority, Jehovah Nisi. So when I say the courage to stand firm in the middle of the battle is only found through the power of the cross, as Christ followers, I want you to hear this. Let's define insignia. Distinguishing marks of authority, office, or honor, badges, tokens, decorations, as the insignia of royalty or of an order, marks of authority, marks of power, marks of high office. So the Bible says, let me pull this together. The Bible says in Isaiah 59, 19, so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and from his glory from the rising of the sun, which is in the east. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of God will raise up a standard against him. That's Jehovah Nisi. What's the standard? The cross. The cross is the banner of Jesus Christ because the cross is the greatest expression of love. God's not mad at you. If God was mad at you, pssst. You may old enough to remember kids in the hall, squish your head. Squish your head. No. No. The cross. God said, I'm gonna raise my son up on the cross against the enemy. The courage to stand firm in the battle, the cleats are called, the, it's called the gospel of peace because there's gotta be a level, a high level of peace to have courage. And so when you begin to think about what it costs God, to raise up a standard against every principality, authority, darkness, every evil demon, every, every demonic force. Love conquers all because God's love, the greatest expression of his love is the cross and the power of the cross has conquered all. So when I know God who created everything, flung the stars into his existence, carpeted the fields with grass, calls me out by name, knows when hairs fall from my head, his thoughts for me, the Bible says, outnumber the grains of sand. He spans the universe, the universes, between his thumb and his forefinger. He could gather all the waters of the earth in a jar in the palm of his hands. Stores up hell in, in storehouses for times of war. This, this God who was, is, and is to come. The alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. There is none beside him. He was before, there was a before. 
He took nothing, turned it into something, and took nothing that was something, and hung that something onto nothing that was nothing before, and then turned something, started it spinning, and here we go. We're still here. That God loves you. And he's fighting for us. Let me tell you, he's already fought for us. It's called the cross. And I'm, I'm not saying this to offend anybody. If you have a necklace on and, and you've got a necklace where Jesus is still hanging on the cross, no offense, he ain't on the cross anymore. And he's not in the tomb. He's alive. We serve a living God. So that standard, Jehovah Nisi, our banner, our standard, the logo, the, the expression, the cause, the power, the authority of the darling of heaven, Jesus Christ himself, giving up his life. He looked at the religious folks and said, I'm gonna get one thing straight with you. You're not taking my life. I'm laying it down. I can't wait to see that replay, like how it actually happened. Because, <laughs> you know, you know how I feel about Jesus. He was, he was not a wimp. He wasn't. And so, I, I want you to, now, watch this. If you, if you read Ephesians chapter six, which we've read every week, talking about pulling, putting on the full armor of God, why? So that we can stand against the, the, the attacks of the enemy. Watch this. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. What do we wrestle against? Principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts, wickedness in heavenly places. So that's what we're fighting against. How do we have peace in that battle? How do we have peace when spiritual warfare is going on in our families, in our businesses? How does that happen? We lean into the power of the cross, the victory of the cross. Colossians, watch this. this. So we know what we're fighting against, right? So we'll start in Colossians 2.12. We're ending the sermon, but we're starting this. Just work with me. Colossians 2.12. So we were buried with Jesus in baptism. First of all, we were dead in our sin, uh, verse 11 says. But then we were saved. We were buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. The Bible says that we are seated with Christ. When we baptize people, there's nothing special about the tap water that comes out of there. Matter of fact, it's just like any other water. You leave it running long enough, it'll flood this whole place. <laughs> but... It's, it's, the, it's the symbolic in the physical that speaks to what's happening in the spiritual. When we baptize people, it's not like something special about the pastor that's baptizing them. Matter of fact, if you're the priest of your home and you're, and you're a godly man or woman and, and you're leading your kids and you're the leader of the home you, and you wanna baptize your kids, come talk to us. We'll get in the tub with you and let you baptize them. So nothing special about the water. It signifies I am dying. My old self is dead. I'm dying with Christ. And when I'm raised up, I'm raised up as a new creation. I'm not the old me. I might still be passionate. If I yelled at the TV during a basketball game before, I'm gonna yell at the TV still. I'm, I'm just, I'm gonna be passionate about different things. Because I've been raised up with Christ. I am seated with Christ. I am joint heirs with Christ. I am in Christ. I am a citizen of another kingdom. I belong to Christ. I'm a child of God. He who began a good work in me is gonna complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. He has plans for me, plans to prosper me and not harm me. So now I have peace to stand firm by my position. Because I am in Christ. Do you see that? 
The only way I'm in Christ is I've died to self. I've been buried with him, right? Like, I have given up my life. The Bible says if you want to find your life, you got to give it up. You know why it's so hard to stay married? Let me say it a different way. Do you know why it takes work <laughs> to stay married? What? We we'll straight up tell you, like, plenty of days. Randy didn't even want to breathe the air that if I was in the room, like, we'll be married 30 years soon. Yeah, whatever, well, yeah. But why, why is that? Because you take two human beings that are very selfish and you put them in a thing called an apartment or a house. And you know God just does it. It's covenant, it's awesome, it's a gift, it's great. And if you work, you work your marriage, it'll work for you. But you know, sometimes he just, boom, and steps back and grabs some popcorn. <laughs> He's like, yep. Jason's gonna learn to pick those underwear up. <laughs> if he don't, they are not having any kids. <laughs> I just quit wearing underwear. Like I was <laughs> he will put that toilet seat down. Mm. I just bought a big enough yard to go outside and pee in. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm working around the system. We are, we are selfish people. We like what we like. But when you, when you say, God, I want to be saved, you don't just say, I want you to be my Savior. You say, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. So let's keep going because remember what we're fighting against. Colossians 2.13 says, and us being dead in your trespass, in our sin, and the uncircumcision of your flesh. In other words, not time to go into that, but just, you know, your flesh wants what your flesh wants. Never feel bad because you're tempted. It's what you do with the temptation. We're all tempted. But watch this. He has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all. So now... I can have peace because I'm standing, but I'm not standing alone, I'm in Christ. The battle's coming, but he's fighting for me. So I got peace with my position, now I've been forgiven. I can have peace with my past. Do you know your past doesn't have to keep haunting you as long as you don't re keep repeating your past? You know if you sow good seed for long enough, all that bad seed you sowed, it's gonna die. And it's going to be overtaken with a harvest of good stuff. But you got to start sowing good seed at some point. Right? You, you, you got to, when you get, and so now I can be at peace with my past because I'm forgiven. He has cast my sin away from him as far as the east is from the west. You take off going east, you keep going east, correct? Yeah. I mean, if you go, he didn't say north and south. You go north, sooner or later you can go south. In other words, my sin was red, now it's white. I was in darkness, but now I live in light. Verse 14, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements, which was the law that was against us, which was contrary to us. In other words, there's no way our flesh what we want is what we want. We weren't gonna be able to fulfill the law. So he takes that law that was contrary to us and he has taken it out of the way. He removed the law. He removed the religious boxes that you have to check. How did he do it? Having them nailed to the cross. Wait a minute, I thought they, they nailed Jesus to the cross. Absolutely. Jesus was the only one who fulfilled every letter of the law. So now God's word has, he, God's a just God. He's justified. So Jesus became flesh and then gave his flesh on the cross to overcome the law. That's good news. That's the gospel of peace. That's how you can be. Now, now watch this. You can have peace without performance. 
How, how cool would it be if the church would stop pretending? How much healing would happen if the church would just stop pretending, performing? I, I don't want to be involved in performance. I want to be in his presence. I, I don't want to perform to make people feel good. My job is not to make you feel good. Matter of fact, the Bible says my job is to provoke you. In our language, we use another word for that. And I used that one time when I was preaching this and there were kids in the room and you know, we don't teach our kids to talk that way. I'm like, okay, well, we have a kid's ministry, but whatever. <laughs> Look, you should leave church sometime a little upset. Like, I can't believe that pastor said, I don't say anything that's not in the Bible. So if you're upset, that means it's sandpaper. And if it's sandpaper, God's loving on you. Because he knows if he can get to that part of you and he can grind that part of you down, a diamond's going to come out. God's not looking for you to be perfect. He knows you can't be. You don't have to perform for God. He already knows you. Now watch this. So you got peace by, peace by position, peace to stand firm. You got peace with your past. You have peace without performance. And then you get down to Colossians 2.15. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle over them, triumphing over them at the cross. Let me read it. This is not a version. It's a translation. It's the passage translation. In other words, it's just the scripture written in like book form. So this is not Holy Scripture. It's someone who took the Holy Scripture. It's a translation, not a version. Big difference. Colossians 2.15. Then Jesus made a public spectacle of all the powers and principalities of darkness, stripping away from them every weapon and all their spiritual authority and power to accuse us. And by the power of the cross, Jesus led them around as prisoners in a procession of triumph. He was not their prisoner, they were his. Now, go back, don't go there. You go back to Ephesians chapter six, verse 12. What are we fighting against? Principalities, powers, authorities, darkness. What did Jesus do at the cross? He disarmed them, he overcame them. Matter of fact, he made a public spectacle of them. He didn't just win, he beat them down. This is the message translation, and I had to read this. Think of it, all sins forgiven, the slate wiped clean, that old arrest warrant canceled, nailed to, the Christ, nailed to Christ's cross. He stripped all the spiritual tyants, ty tyrants in the universe of their sham fake authority at the cross and marched them naked through the streets. You're going to beat me and you're going to hang me? You, you, Jesus, you're going to hang me naked? I'm going to give myself for the joy set before me. I'm going to do the will of the Father. But then the Bible says, he led captivity captive. What am I trying to say to you tonight? If you are going through a battle and you are thinking about giving up and you're, you're thinking about turning your back and you're thinking about running and just saying, you know what? I just, I just can't do this anymore. Devil, I'm gonna quit serving God if you'll just leave me alone. And we laugh at that, but I mean, some of us have had like those thoughts, like I'm just gonna slip back in back here. Listen, the devil hates you either way. Like we're all gonna go through stuff in our life. If you're having those thoughts, I'll, and, and, and you're, you, you, the sure-footedness would be like so far from defined where you're at in the battle, can I just tell you, if you'll come back to the cross tonight, reevaluate the cross. Reevaluate re the power of love and what kind of love it took God to send Jesus to go through what he went through. But because he went through it, because he was a man among men, because he carried the cross, he was beaten 
the chastisement for our peace was upon him, the power of the cross gives courage to stand firm in the gospel of peace. Why is it the gospel of peace? Romans 5.1, therefore we have been justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Not only that, we're now at peace with God. We're justified in the eyes of God. We have peace. You're at peace with God because of what Jesus did. It's beautiful. It's peace. It's the gospel of peace. Will every day be hunky-dory after you get saved? Absolutely not. Will the bank account be more? Mm, probably not. Stuff still break? I've told you this. I'm gonna keep telling you. Will your car still break down? Yes. But here's the deal. This is what you get to start doing. God, your car broke down. If you're struggling with an addiction tonight, if you're struggling with running, if you're struggling with quitting, if there's no peace, and you're like, if I could just get away from this, or God would just remove the circumstance, or, or he would just, if he would just, if he would just do this, because we're really good at telling God how to be God, aren't we? God, if you would just do this, I would have peace. And God is saying tonight, you already have the power and authority to live at peace because it was bought, paid for at the cross. The power and authority to live a life of peace where peace rules your heart. But you gotta let it. Don't run. Don't turn your back on your family. Don't turn your back on yourself. Don't say, you know what, I've tried. I've tried, this is like the 40, 88th time I've tried to, to get clean. Well, baby, maybe 89 is your number. Don't give up on God because he will never give up on you. And th those, those attacks against you and your family, some of you in here have kids. You don't even know where they're at. Hadn't talked to them in a while on drugs, running the streets. God knows where they're at. Don't you stop praying for them. Don't you stop. I've seen it time and time again. They'll come home. They'll come home. They'll be sitting beside you in church, right? If you let them. And if you're still in church, and if you're still standing firm, how do I do that? Courage, how do I have courage? power of the cross. It's the gospel of peace. Would you bow your heads all over this place? It was my strongest desire coming into tonight that no matter where we landed in the scripture, that if this is as far as we got, because I wrote a bunch more, but if this was as far as we got, I was fine with that because so many of us are so beaten up. We're hurt, we've been rejected, walked out on, abandoned, we're grieving. We don't understand. We've lost our job. We're at an age in life where we should have more, but we got less. Whatever it is, can I just tell you? Listen, keep standing. Keep having courage. Keep having courage. Listen, mourning lasts for the night. Uh, uh, weeping lasts for the night. But joy comes in the morning. The Bible doesn't tell us what morning the victory comes. He doesn't tell us what morning the battle is gonna be over. He doesn't tell us what, because we're, we're not on, on, he's not on our calendar. He's not on our time frame. But I tell you, I tell you what, man. I have committed to the best of my ability to stand and see the salvation of the Lord in my circumstances, in my family circumstances, in your, I pastor you, so in your circumstances, I know what some of you are going through. Stand, so my strongest desire tonight, outside of someone being saved, was that you would get a new fight. 
and you would realize it's really not your fight. The fight was at the cross. The war, the battle was at the cross. The attacks come, but now we have the full armor of God so we can stand firm in the battle. Pray, pray, shut, pray with me right now. I usually don't do this, but pray with me. You don't have to pray out loud, but if, if you've lost your fight and you, you've, been temp, you've been thinking about running, you've been thinking about quitting, you've not been in the word, you're confused, just pray this with me, God, Lord, I know, I know you live in me. I know I've given my heart to you and I know I'm saved. So would you, would you just bring a, a fresh wind and a fresh fire, a fresh fight? Lord, would you bring a fresh fight to my spirit? I'm weary. I'm weary, Lord. Refresh me tonight. Refresh me. Lord, I thought this thing was gonna go 12, 12 rounds and we're, we're in round 23. God, come on, pray with me. Remind me that I was built for this. Remind me, Lord, that I have, you've given me, I am equipped for this. I am equipped to make it through this battle. I am equipped to make it through this season. I am equipped to make it. And then make a commitment to yourself. Let hope arise, let courage arise. And if it's just for tonight and tomorrow, I'm gonna stand, I ain't running. Tonight till this time tomorrow, I'm not running. And, and you can deal with the next day, the next day. I'm gonna stand firm. I will stand firm because of all that God did for me, I have peace. It's the gospel. Let it ignite a new fight in you. Pray again, ask again, hope again, love again, trust again. Perhaps you're here tonight, everybody's head's bowed. Perhaps you're here tonight, you're watching, watching online or you're in the room. If you're watching online, I can't see you, obviously. But you would say, I heard you talk about being at peace with God. I heard you say salvation. I heard you say justified by faith. I don't really understand all of that, but I know I feel something. There's a void in my life. I've been searching, I've been seeking. That void was put there by God and only he can fill it. We're at peace with God through faith because when you put your faith, your faith, no one can put your faith, no one can put your faith in Jesus for you. No denomination, you can't get sprinkled when you're a baby. No, when you're old enough, you say, what? Well, what is faith? We all have it. It's where you place your belief. Bible says when you put your faith in God and you confess and believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and that he is the true son of God, he's the savior of the world, you shall be saved. We are saved by faith. But no one can do that for you. If that's you tonight and you say, you know what, Pastor Jason, tonight's my night. I've been thinking about it, or maybe you just wandered in here, or maybe you're here as a guest of someone, or maybe you're watching online, but you say, I know that I, I know I need Jesus in my life. I wanna, I wanna receive the gift of salvation from God through what Jesus did. Slip your hand up. Slip your hand up before we dismiss. I wanna pray with you. Yeah. Yes. Anyone else? And don't you let anything keep your, if that's you, don't you let anything keep your hand down. That's just a small expression of saying, I need you, Lord. We all need him. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Praise the Lord. If you're watching online, whether it's tonight or 10 years from now, gospel's still the same. Jesus died for you. So if you're watching this, you're not in the room, Pray this same prayer with me. If you're in the room, pray with me. Nothing special about me. I'm just gonna give you some verbiage for you putting your faith in Jesus. Pray this. God, thank you for loving me so much that you sent Jesus, your only son, to die for me. And right now, I receive this free gift of salvation that you've provided through sending your only son. 
and I'm confessing that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and I'm putting my faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins. Jesus, come into my life, invade my life, be the Lord of my life. I give up control of my life. Thank you that you are Jesus, my Savior. I want you to be Jesus, my Lord. Take all of me, the good, the bad, the ugly, I give it all to you. If that's you and you pray, just feel that weight lifting off of you right now. Yes. Yes, you are a new creation. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, if you just got saved, we celebrate with you. Come on. Look, Pastor Anthony and Brooke are over here, and Pastor Ethan's over here. If you just got saved or you got saved last week and hadn't come up and talked to somebody, come get a Bible, get a knuckle or a hug. If you're not a hugger, get a fist bump. Um, prayer team's coming forward if you need prayer for anything. If you struggle with addiction or our loved one does, right out those doors right before you go outside to the right. It's an entire room. Lots of information. We want to help you. Good? May the Lord bless you keep you, his face shine upon you, and everything you do this week prosper. Amen? See you tomorrow night, night of prayer. Monday night, night of prayer.